Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, Tracy here from Keto and Crime. Thank you so much to every single one of my patrons and channel members. You make this possible. And uh, you're one of the reasons I do this. And I thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And if I haven't said it before, thank you. I'll sing it. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there with me and letting me geek out, not making fun of me like a lot of other people do because I like weird stuff about crime and dark history. Re, re. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. Today, I've got a review of a Southern scandal, the Murdoch Murders, the Netflix three-episode docuseries that released a couple of months ago on, uh, on the streaming service. So if you have Netflix, it's there. Um, it is a docu-series, which means it is a documentary that is essentially split into three parts, which means that it is usually, in most cases, documentaries are slanted to one side or the other. Uh, very little, uh, very few documentaries. There's a couple out there, Jesus Camp, um, Kidnapped for Christ, that just roll camera and let whatever happens happen without interjecting any opinion. But most documentaries, that is 99.5% of them, are made with a slant in mind. There's a narrative behind it. They're really wanting to pitch you whatever the documentary film company believes. And in this case, it is that the Murdaws are dirty, they're evil, and they did everything they're accused of. And so that is the slant of this docuseries. It is split into three, about 45 minute episodes and goes, essentially starts with the Mallory Beach uh, boating incident and then moves forward to the murders and then uh, backtracks a bit to talk about Gloria Satterfield and Stephen Smith. So it covers everything uh, pretty in depth, except for perhaps Alex Murdoch's financial crimes, and uh, those are still unfolding. You know, there's 99 counts of uh, financial crimes in, uh, in conjunction with all the embezzlement that took place at the law firm that his great-grandfather started that he was a partner at and was later fired from. So that is the timeline, and I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to go through and summarize it uh, for you. Um, and get the, hit the high points. I learned some things from this documentary I did not know, even though I've done an in-depth analysis of uh, the case. Um, and you can find those videos in a uh, Murdoch playlist where I go through everything. We know that since this, this came out when the trial had been set. It wasn't quite... The trial had was almost ready to start when this came out. So, of course, the verdict is nowhere in this. We do know that he was found guilty of both counts of murder toward Paul and Maggie, and it was sentenced to life in prison. Now, his convictions or charges for the financial crimes are still pending, so we'll have to see what happens. But he's going to be serving life in prison anyway, so it's kind of moot. Um, so let's talk about it. Uh, the first one starts essentially with the Mallory Beach incident. It goes into a lot of background on Paul. Now, Paul was, according to the people interviewed in this video, and there were several of them, there was uh, Morgan, who was Paul's ex-girlfriend, her parents, Mallory Beach's family, uh, as well as some of their friends, uh, Connor, uh, Miley, who were incidentally the kids that were involved in that boating accident. So you have to kind of take, you know, take everything that I'm saying with a grain of salt, because even though I, I truly believe Alex Murdoch is guilty and I believe Paul was absolutely responsible for this accident, I don't know how true some of the allegations there 
throwing out. Keep in mind, it's a documentary. So, basically, they talked about how it seemed that Alec and Maggie favored their older son, Buster, because Buster was, you know, went to a college, was in a fraternity, wanted to be a lawyer, whereas Paul preferred to party. He liked to work with his hands. He liked to hunt, liked to fish, liked to work on boats, work on motorcycles. He was kind of the black sheep of the family. And how the his parents made that vehemently, you know, uh, picture perfect to anybody that cared to look. They weren't hiding the fact that they favored Buster, according to his ex-girlfriend, um, Morgan. But she did say that Paul was close to exactly two people. His grandfather, Randolph, who was Alec's father, and... Gloria Satterfield, their longtime housekeeper, who he considered to be his actual mom because Maggie evidently never had time for him. So he was close to exactly two people. But she said that because of his close relationship with Randolph, who had been a solicitor for Hampton County, South Carolina, um, and just the family's influence, he got away with a lot of stuff. He was on his way to being a functional alcoholic. She said he loved a power drink. He would get into random driving incidents. She told about a time that they had been uh, driving in a pickup truck and he had ran it off the road and caused it to flip. And she called 911. He took her phone from her, cut it off, and threw it into a body of water so that 911 could not trace it. And then called his grandfather who showed up with Alex and Maggie and they essentially had the truck towed, removed all evidence of drinking, all the guns he had in it, and pretty much swept it all under the rug. And this was not the first incident of Randolph having fixed something for Paul. So she said even though he was definitely not the favored son in the family, he was the most poignant about saying, I can do whatever I want to because I'm a Murdoch. Now again, take this with a grain of salt. And then it moves forward to... The night in February of 2018, the boating accident uh, when they were heading over to a oyster, an oyster boil, crab boil thing on one of the islands near Paris Island in South Carolina. And Paul did not want to drive because he knew that there would be checkpoints and he wanted to drink. So he uh, rambled up the party of six. There was him, a Morgan, Mallory. Her boyfriend, Anthony, Connor, and Connor's boyfriend, a girlfriend, Miley. These were the six. Now, um, basically, they were all good friends. Uh, they all liked to drink, liked to party. It seemed a lot of the girls said that they did not want to go to the party because their boyfriends did. They, they went ahead and went. Anthony said he didn't really want to go, but you know, Mallory kind of convinced him because she wanted to hang out with her girlfriends. Okay, fine. So they all get on this boat and they stop uh, for Paul to go in and use his brother Buster's ID to buy $50 worth of liquor and beer at a local liquor store. And then they pile on the boat, go to the party, and then get belligerently drunk and decide they're going to come back. Now, according to the people interviewed, they wanted to call a cab, call an Uber, get a ride. They did not want Paul to drive, but he said, or they, one of them wanted to drive the boat. He said, no, it's my boat. I'm going to drive. And so they ended up being taken by Paul, according to them, against their will, into the boat to come back. Now, I don't know how much of that I believe, but I do believe that there was drunk people driving that boat, for sure. And so, basically, um, we get into more about Morgan and Paul's relationship, how it was semi-abusive. He had been known to put his hands on her, uh, verbally abuse her. The parents didn't really like her because she wasn't high class. I mean, that's essentially what she said. She was from the wrong side of the tracks. And so... Basically, uh, they get into this boat, and Paul is belligerently drunk. He and Connor are taking turns driving the boat, but basically what they were saying is that Paul was recklessly driving, and then he would just walk away because he was in an argument with somebody and leave the boat unmanned, and then Connor would step over and, and drive the boat. So that was the extent of Connor, his last name is Cook, driving it. And so basically, um, there was a lot of hoopla, and eventually Paul just started driving really recklessly, going in circles. You know, they're in a boat, can't really get out, and eventually they ended up slamming into the bridge. 
throwing Mallory and Anthony, who were in the back of the boat, out. Anthony was able to get back into the boat, but Mallory was nowhere to be seen. She had been swept away by the current. And of course, Connor made the uh, 911 call that brought uh, that brought rescuers in, but Paul never called 911. And according to the people on the boat, he was more concerned with getting in touch with his grandfather. And it wasn't until rescuers had arrived and they were back on shore that he was uh, allowed to get to a cell phone and called his grandfather and then just basically mentioned, yeah, we can't find Mallory, just kind of matter of factly. He was not wanting to get into the ambulances and basically did not want to do anything until members of his family arrived. But eventually they did get all the wounded except for Anthony, who was hysterical looking for his girlfriend Mallory and he would not leave. It's also noted and recorded by law enforcement uh, body cam that Anthony did threaten Paul and said he would kill him if Mallory is dead. Keep that in mind. Also, there's a whole lot of video evidence that showed that Paul was never questioned outside of them trying to get him into the boat and that all the other uh, four kids were telling the law enforcement straight up that Paul was driving. So keep that under your hat as well. And that's where episode one ends with the search for Mallory in the first few hours after the accident. Then we cut to episode two, which continues from the Mallory uh, incident and then gets into the actual murders of Paul and Maggie. So uh, basically it starts with the risk search and rescue teams and the South Carolina Department of uh, Interior Resources. They're searching, and there's a little bit of back talk about how um, the Murdochs were so well connected and how the law enforcement were obviously treating this with kid gloves that uh, Alex's brother was the one that made the call to Interior Resources and that they were the ones that handled the removal of the boat, that none of the other family members of the kids that were involved in the accidents other than the Murdochs themselves were allowed to go down and see the boat. So basically, they were keeping everyone else away. Law enforcement never called Mallory's family, never called any of the uh, the Cook family, any of the other kids that were involved. St bystanders had, or other family members had to reach out. So you see how this was already kind of being set up to be shown as that they were sweeping this under the rug, just like every other incident with Paul had been swept under the rug. And then we cut to the hospital where... Um, basically, the kids are being treated, and Randolph and Alex make an appearance, according to medical staff and security people on hand. They And the kids themselves, they did make a point of trying to bust up in where the kids were being treated, saying they were the kids' attorneys and they would be handling this. And also, um, you had Alex making a phone call to um, Connor Cook's the boy that was, you know, taking up the slack when he wasn't driving's family, basically saying, we know Connor was driving. I'm going to defend Connor in court. He was also starting to spread that same story around the hospital, trying to get the kids on his side. Now, this is according to medical staff, which I don't think they would have any, because none of them were in the documentary. I don't think they would have any cause to lie. And he was, they were already trying to, to spin this story that Connor was driving. And so, um, that's basically what the first part of that episode is about, is how this started to spin. And Mallory said that she, when she arrived um, at the scene, Randolph and Alex were already there, and she was trying to talk to Randolph, saying they still haven't found my daughter. And she said that Randolph very callously said, we probably know how that's going to end, don't we? Just very callous, according to the mom. And if he said that, he needs to burn in a personal hell for it. But uh, by the next day, which Mallory had still not been found, Mallory was not found until seven days after the accident, two conflicting stories were spreading around Hampton County, South Carolina. One, Paul was driving, and the Murdochs were doing their normal covering it up, or that, and that Connor was driving. So, um, yeah. Three days after the accident, uh, Alex called M Marty Cook, who is Connor's father, for a private meeting, uh, he went to go meet him. He said that uh, he assured Marty he was not recording anything, just being very, you know, co covert about it. 
and basically wanted to know where his head was and what he was planning to do about this. And he said that Connor, who had to have jaw surgery because his jaw was dislocated, had already said, Dad, I'm scared. People disappear around that family all the time. I'm afraid he's going to try to kill me to protect Paul. So he already had like that in his head. And he said basically Paul was trying to get him over on his side to say his own son had been the one driving the boat, but Marty wasn't having any part of it. Um, they also allege that the Murdochs, because of their connections with law enforcement and the Department of the Interior there in Hampton, South Carolina, were slowing down the search or impeding the search for Mallory because, you know, the theory was that no body, no crime, and therefore there was no crime for anybody to be charged with. So there was that kind of thing in, inserted. And it wasn't until seven days later that the search and rescue team did find Mallory's body. It had been swept downstream. And, of course, then... Um, the uh, surviving kids and their families, as well as the Beach family, decided they were going to hire their own attorney in the form of Mr. Mark Tinsley. And Mark Tinsley, with the help of his invest his private investigator, started to weave together a s video evidence, audio evidence, and eyewitness evidence that Paul, not Connor, had been driving to prepare not only for a possible defense for Connor, but also for a civil suit against the Murdochs. Basically, this dossier showed uh, video evidence from the docks showing Paul buying the alcohol, Paul kind of being a drunk, belligerent uh, alter ego that he got into called Timmy. Must have been watching a lot of South Park, but he was Timmy when he was drunk, and everybody called him Timmy, so it was almost like two personalities. Showing him in Timmy mode, uh, there was, you know, Witnesses from the party that said that Paul insisted on driving, and there was the eyewitness evidence uh, from the people in the boat as well. And then it showed that Paul was the one that used a phony ID to buy, or used his brother's ID to buy the alcohol. And the medical statements from the medical personnel saying how it seemed that the Murdochs were trying to spin the story. And that basically finally, even though law enforcement never arrested Paul, he never, his mugshot was taken at his arraignment in court. I mean, he was never treated as a criminal in any way, shape, or form. And finally, law enforcement had to accept that, yes, Paul was driving and that there was charges filed after local law enforcement recused themselves from the case because of their connections with the Murdochs. Now, that part I do believe. I do believe that the Murdochs had enough influence. That's the reason I thought Alex Murdoch would walk because of the family influence, but I guess there is some justice in the world. Charges were not filed until April of 2019 when a whole new investigative team was brought in. Uh, he never spent a day in jail. He moved out of the family home at Moselle and moved into the uh, log cabin way out in the woods. He continued to live his life, post party, drink, post on Snapchat. He even got some speeding tickets along the way. Just Acting like nothing had ever happened, Anthony did say that he attempted to apologize to, Paul attempted to apologize to him for what happened, and Anthony just said, get away from me, I don't want anything to do with you. So basically, he was just living his life. Mallory did, uh, excuse me, Morgan did break up with him. Uh, she counts that Mallory, you know, was her, her best friend and was kind of like a guardian angel because that was the catalyst that this is not a good relationship for me. And so... During the time that Paul was living in the cabin, you also had the breakdown of the Murdoch marriage. Maggie had hired a forensic attorney to break down their finances with all the missing missing money. And then you had the embezzlement charges come in from the law firm, you know, during this whole thing. And then just their marriage was breaking down and essentially Maggie moved out and moved to one of their vacation homes. And then you had Buster get thrown out of law school for plagiarism. So you had that on the, adding that onto the plate and Paul and everybody was under a lot of stress. And then of course you have the murder of Paul and Maggie. We all know the story there. They were shot um, with a, Paul was shot with a shotgun, which it was very hard to trace. But Maggie, and I got this wrong in my initial assessment, Maggie was actually shot with an AR-15 type rifle that was traced to Alex Murdoch. 
and uh, but still, no suspects were officially announced for months after the murders. And then it cuts to episode three, where it goes back in time to talk about the Stephen Smith and Gloria Satterfield cases. Uh, nothing really new here, except that, you know, Stephen Smith was found in the middle of the road. His shoes were still on, which law enforcement said was strange for a hit and run. But a private investigator hired by Stephen Smith's mother, he was also interviewed. His name was Steve Peterson talked about the things that he found out. And he said by the time he got to it, a lot of this was just rumor. And they talked to some journalists uh, from from some of the local papers. And they said that, yes, a lot of the evidence in that case was rumor. But if you know anything about small town in the South, lots of rumors end up being at least partially true. So what they had found out from talking to uh, kids that Stephen and Buster went to high school with that Stephen had been tutoring Buster, and there was rumors that they may have had a gay affair, and that uh, the rumors were that uh, Buster, afraid of it coming to light, had taken two friends and was the ones that uh, killed Stephen that night. That was the rumor, but none of that has ever been proven substantially, so that's all conjecture, but of course they paint it in a very ominous, you know, ominous way because it's a documentary and they've already judged and convicted the Murdoch family. And that is, I'm not being an apologist from them. I think they're pretty bad, much bad people, but you got to remember this is a documentary. And then, of course, that case kind of fades away. It's still on the back burner. I think it's still an open investigation, but I doubt anything will ever come of that, unfortunately, for Stevens and Stevens' family. Uh, Morgan did say that she actually asked Paul and his family about the rumors about Buster and Stephen, and they very vehemently, Maggie and Alec very vehemently said, we would never... We wouldn't have killed that F word. So, yeah. Take that. And then it goes to the 2018 death of Gloria Satterfield. Previously, I had mentioned she fell down a staircase in their house. It was actually the steps leading up to the front door. And the official story was she tripped over the family dogs, laid in the hospital for three days, and eventually died. And according to Alec, she's the one that told him what happened. Uh... Paul actually made the 911 call when they found her. Uh, Paul was devastated, and you know, she eventually died. Uh, Alec was supposed to file a claim against his own liability insurance to get money to pay uh, Gloria's family. However, that money has not been paid to date, at least not from what I could find. Now, the real dark, ominous part of this is that a lot of, again, just like with the Stephen Smith case, rumors abound. And the rumor was that Gloria knew too much and that this was right in the height of Alex's prescription pill addiction and that she had found lots of pills hidden, taped under furniture and hidden in certain places from Alex. And being scared of Maggie, not wanting to lose her job, she had gone to Paul, who she had raised as almost a second son. And according to all the ominous rumors uh paul did tell his mother and his mother took care of the situation or even paul might have taken care of the situation um all of paul's friends said that he would never have hurt maggie that he was devastated he may have told his mother about the pills but he would never have hurt maggie so i'm going to take those friends at their word um so if there was foul play i would say it did not lie on paul um and then, of course, it jumps forward to the, you know, where he hired somebody to attempt to kill him while he was changing a flat tire, which ended up being bogus. And then his being let go from his uh, family law firm for embezzlement and now being charged with 99 counts of fraud. And then eventually being charged with the murders. And as we all know, he was found guilty. So really, outside of more in-depth analysis on the rumors, you know, surrounding this family, um, this documentary really didn't supply any new information that we didn't already know, but it's put together in a very entertaining way. You, you get to hear people that you wouldn't normally hear from. There's lots of social media posts, texts, things that were released, which proves a lot of the things that we heard in the trial. And it was essentially Alex's lies that got him uh, convicted. Uh, as far as we know, Buster is still standing strong with Alec. Who knows? Um, will we ever know what happened to Gloria and Stephen? Probably not, unfortunately, because it is just rumor and you can't convict somebody on rumor. So I give the, 
I give it three and a half stars. It was very entertaining. It didn't provide a whole lot of information except for the rumor part, but it was still entertaining. And so for that reason, I say it's worth a watch. You know, it's three 45 minute episodes. You're looking at the time of a good long movie, you know, two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. So I highly recommend checking it out. It's pretty well put together, but just take it with a grain of salt. And uh, so that's my review and summary of A Southern Scandal. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back soon with another Third Reich video. We're going into the Hitler's inner circle, so you're going to get closer and closer to Hitler as we go in. And so with that being said, until next time, keto and crime.